Bear with me, my wife is good enough to come to the presentation and she can uh, make sure everything's looked okay after. Uh, and I realize I'll probably have to hit the escape button to get where we need to get to. The last thing I have, uh, could I get a volunteer maybe? Somebody that could just, Brian? Sure, Mike. Fellow, fellow well in here? That's not the tech side of you though. That's okay. <laughs> probably, um, can you hit the escape button? <coughs> That's probably all I'll need. Being, you know, my first uh, time to attend the meeting, uh, there was one in Toronto I had a chance to uh, when the Drapers were there in the summertime. But uh, you know, from my perspective, I've kind of fallen out of the sky, literally with a, a two-pound book, and uh, nobody really knows who I am or how this all came about. Uh, you know, the there, I'd say there's a bit of a story right there besides the obvious story, which is the 72 Summit series. So. Just uh, briefly about myself, um, I'm an avid hockey fan, and especially of international hockey, and I'm a professional accountant, a certified management accountant at CMA. Uh, as a kid, I could say I loved, I, I didn't love NHL hockey, I liked it, but that was not true after the summer series. That's when I became fully passionate about it, and especially in international hockey. I, I still work like watching the NHL, but I'd be as happy turning on a World Hockey Championship game as your average NHL game. Uh, it's just a different kind of game, different kind of hockey. When you see the Canadian uh, team representing your country, I think that's pretty special. It, it is to me. And uh, you know, so basically the 72 Summit Series changed my, uh, my outlook on hockey, and that's why I'm here today. Uh, it was and remains the, one of the most memorable and exciting moments of my life. And I'm here to talk about my self-published book. It's a bit of a mouthful. It's uh, 1972, Summer Series, Canada vs. USSR, Stat Slides, Videotape and Videotape, The Untold Story of Hockey Series of the Century. And uh, I'm glad to be able to say that uh, I had partners that assisted me, uh, Paul Pasco and Robert McCaskill. Uh, you may not recognize Robert McCaskill's name, but I hope you would uh, after I, I talk about it. He is the producer of 2D sets. And without him and work he did and the people who helped uh, recover the footage of the series, there would be no book. I wouldn't be here. And we wouldn't, I, I don't think we'd ever learn uh, what I call the uh, series we thought we knew. Um, in a nutshell, I thought I was fairly concerned about the series. Uh, it was seven and a half when it happened. Uh, I remembered it vividly. Um, in 2002, my wife was kind enough to get me this box set, which was the first one that came out, Team of the Century. And I sat down just after Christmas, and I'm a stats guy. I've always enjoyed stats, uh, attendance figures for whatever reason. No way anyone else would care, but if there's 9,000 people uh, attending a game, you know, in uh, wherever, <laughs> name doesn't come off the top, Columbus, for example, or if there's 14,000, I, I, that interests me, you know, how, how many showed up at the uh, St. Louis game. Uh, but from there as well, you know, scoring stats, uh, favorite players, how they did, um, how they played goals, shorthand, just the minutia has always kind of interested me. So what I did is I ended up, I don't have a hand at this moment, but I put in the DVD and I took out my Death of Legend, which was a very well-written book, uh, done shortly after the series. And I started the game, and what I wanted to do was just see, did they make any mistakes? Couldn't tell you why I uh, thought that, why there would even be mistakes, why it interested me. But that was what I did, and uh, so much happened from there. And again, that's, that's why I'm here today. Uh, it's going to take a moment. I just wanted to, uh, before we get into the gist of it, I'd like to thank uh, SIHR because I feel this organization represents uh, everything you could want to recognize and remember what's happened. And I think there's a real lack of that today. 
uh, everything is instant, gone, you know, here at this moment and gone the next. I think that's a mistake, a huge mistake, because uh, history is, in the end, that's all we got. Uh, when we're done and gone, you know, the, how, is, how are people going to remember you? And if there's no remembering of things, then why do we do what we do? Uh, I'd like to say it's a legacy of sorts. Everyone has their own personal legacy. Uh, I guess in the end, this is mine. Um, you know, something I hope to uh, contribute to back in research and uh, the history of the game. And again, hopefully uh, once I can share part of that story with you, uh, to help you see what I learned, and maybe you'll see something that you didn't think was possible to know about the series. I mean, it's kind of like the Titanic in a sense. We know what happened. The Titanic is something. And that, you know, a lot of people lost their lives, and that's the story. The 72 series, you know, it was we were supposed to win easily, and we were supposed to crush these uh, upstarts from the Soviet Union, and instead they uh, crushed us in game one. Pretty basic story. We all think, I, you know, imagine if I asked everyone right now, what happened in game one? We were in shape. We weren't ready for it. That's all true. But what I hope I was able to do when I started watching games is to like, start to dig down a little and say, well, why did that happen? Were we really in shape? Were we really unprepared? And if we were, why? Like, what happened? And the books themselves, there are a lot of great books on the series, um, but it's still, until I actually started seeing the games again, and I remember them quite well, but there was a... I was getting very yeah. Sorry. 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 Yourself, you know, 
I, did I make a fair and proper interpretation? Or did I discover something that was before our eyes that somehow we missed? And is the 72 series actually the series we remember it to be? Like, did everybody do exactly what we thought they did for the reasons we thought they did? And again, when I show you a few clips, I'll point out certain things, and hopefully you get a chance to see the picture as I saw it. And for me, I'm an animated individual when I start talking, so I can't help that. But uh, it was exciting. Like, there I was literally, um, a lot of the book, the last part of it was written from 11 to 2 in the morning because I didn't have time during my work day and my kids and all that. So there I'd be sitting there at 1.30 in the morning and I'd literally be under my breath going, I can't believe this. Or, wow. Because it was just one thing after another. And I, I literally uh, built the stacks from, uh, from nothing. Uh, I went to uh, different sites to find uh, examples of everything and scoring some reason that, and started to create my own templates because I found there wasn't anything that met my needs. Uh, as I started to dig further, I was able to get new information that had never been reported on the series. It took a lot of time, a lot of work, but it was, I think, well worth it because again, the picture, I'm not in the puzzle, but I don't want to puzzle a lot of This turned out to be the biggest puzzle, uh, you can imagine. But once the pieces started to fit, and the picture started to change from what I thought I knew. And uh, it was also interwoven. It's, uh, I think a lot of you find, you, you'll see a name of Lester Patrick. And Lester Patrick is Lester Patrick the player, and then there's Lester Patrick the goalie, and then there's Lester Patrick the manager, and then there's Lester Patrick the manager. And each of those are all connected in interconnected with so many other things, the teams we played with, other players. Again, I think there's so much more of the 72 series than we thought we knew. So what I do is, we get to the them. Basically, where it all began. This is just before the first goal in Montreal. So I'm just showing a screen capture here of uh, called the, um, it was footage of the shot behind the scenes of the series. And I was given permission by Roger Brown, who originally sourced out the footage, and the Hockey Hall of Fame of Planet Heather to uh, scale the research, screen grabs in the book. Uh, I've used a couple here just to show you, you know, there's goal one. But what I'd like to do now, show what happened and how my journey began. Interestingly, 
as far as I can tell, the Soviet players did not train together as the Soviet national team. They trained as their own club teams. They actually didn't come together as the Soviet national team until around August 22nd, surprisingly. So they were actually together less time than the Canadian team. But of course, they played together in the Olympic Championships and Olympics. So doing this was not any big deal for that. So these are some interesting side notes to, uh, to pre-game. Another thing I learned, I wasn't able to add in the book, I learned it about it after. Soviet players were sitting in their hotel lobby, drinking black coffee and eating pastries at about 6.30. The game started early. Now, if you're on the Soviet team, just my impression, why would you be drinking black coffee and eating pastries uh, at maybe the most important game of your life? My take on it? They didn't think they were going to play. They came to game one hoping that they train like sons of guns, they hoped for the best, but I don't think they were really believing that they were going to do what was going to happen. So there's two different sides to the story that I try to cover in the book. One is the stats side. The stats only are a reflection of what happened. The stats should give you more insight into the play, but when you see the video, it's something else. There's things you just can't necessarily cover in your words. So again, what I tried to do in the stats is reflect what actually happened in the United States because when I looked at the original stats, starting with the very first uh, goal by Canada, the very, very first 30 seconds, is things just didn't match. And you would think, after all these years, all this stuff would have been accounted for or discussed or whatever. But somehow it wasn't. Thank you. 
they corrected the goal right away to the last position. So it ends up. It looks like this. And hopefully you can see it. I don't want to keep jumping back and forth in the slideshow if I, if I keep losing it. This is my revised story summary. This is the original story summary in any newspaper or book that was printed. So again, Phil Esposito for Frank Mahat, legendary Bergman, when it should have been Phil Esposito for Frank Mahat, legendary Park. So right off the bat, like I said, I went on and on. The 63 goals scored, scored in the series. If this one is wrong, and it seems to be clearly obvious who, who did what. What, you know, what am I going to be faced with as I look at the rest of the games? So I think I had an inkling of uh, where things were headed, even from that moment. Now, I, I wanted to make a side note. This is something I realized later when I was almost done the book. Does anyone remember what Brad Park's uh, NHL number was? With the Rangers? Two. Two. In this series, does anyone remember what Brad Park's number was? Five. Reason being, Gary Bergman had seniority. So Gary Bergman was two. So I wonder if the statistician just automatically should see, seeing number two, thought Park, when in fact they should have been, they are sorry, they thought Park, they thought Park when it should have been Bergman, or vice versa, because they were so used to Brad Park wearing number two. I don't know if that's the case, but as we go through this, and as we uh, will discover in the book, if you uh, get one, that Brad Park uh, is a central figure to, uh, to what happened in this story. So anyways, here is the corrected scoring summary for game one. You've got the correction on uh, the first goal, Bergman for Park. You've got a second goal, Henderson from Clark. But I also have Ron out. I'll show you that one in a minute. And then you look at the USR, USSR scoring summary. You've got four, four corrections and one time of goal revision. The very first goal, I am positive, was not scored at 11 40, as was reported in every newspaper and every book since the, you know, since the series happened. And there's a number of clues to that. I, I, I won't go through all the detail. I kind of probably go through too much detail. But as long and short of it is Foster Hewitt is giving updates at the time before the Soviet scored the first goal. And it's well past 11.40. And yet that's what the, uh, the announcer says after the goal. You can actually hear him vaguely. You put on headphones and hear him talking in the background. But it's wrong. I, I'm almost positive it was 12 for it. And uh, I have a number of secondary sources to verify it. So to me, we're, we're not changing history. In fact, I think the original scoring summary of the Sun series changed history. They did not reflect what actually happened. So what I hope to do was not change history, but try and reflect what actually happened, and to let everyone you know look at it on their own. To because uh, YouTube has a number of the videos now. We don't necessarily have to have the games on the DVD. But if this is the chance to go and revisit it, start to look at the series in a different light start to see maybe what players did better than we, we thought they did. And if that's the case, then what, how do you feel about that player now, knowing that maybe he got more points or less points than what we thought they did? So again, this is kind of the building of the story as I went along. Now, you'll bear with me. This isn't the easiest uh, <coughs> thing to uh, make the time, so I'll try and get it to where So just before Canada's second goal, I'll try and hit the mark just a little bit. That's good. So there's about to be a face-off in the Soviet end after a nice and call. And watch closely what happens on the scoring play. Snapped it 
And actually, if you watch closely, I think the puck actually slowly ticks off by a shattering skate, which is why Trechiak got surprised by it. I've watched it a number of times. Trechiak doesn't get beaten from that far out. You can't really see it too clearly, but see how Shadron turns? I think it just slightly deflected off and went off. But the scoring play, as you saw in the other thing, said so Clark from Henderson. Or, Pen uh, sorry, Henderson from Bobby Clark. What happened to Ron Ellis? Like, is this not as obvious as obvious can be? Like, I think in, in doing the stats, uh, you know, two goals, already two corrections. I don't think I was coming up with anything that anybody else could have done. You know, it's not that I did anything special. That's not the case at all. What I felt as an accountant, you know, I have that attention to detail. I like things to add up. And I like things to fit with, you know, with the facts. And the facts weren't fitting. And so this is where it all began. You know, this is how I started it. But it all actually all began in terms of correcting the stats. This, the book was never envisioned at all by myself. Number one reason, I'd never written a book. And I didn't know how I would write a book. I didn't know, didn't. basically I just wanted to set the stats right. And then having that done, I thought maybe I'd partner with somebody on the book or something. But it turned out the uh, meeting in 2007, after I completed all the Canadian stats, that was 2004, presented on um, Joe Peltier's uh, Summit Series group, uh, got really good feedback. A lot of people were very happy, but there was one person who said, who cares? <laughs> what does it matter if a uh, player got more points? It doesn't matter. And I thought, wow, I guess it doesn't change anything. I mean, we still won. But again, when you put, start putting the facts together, does it change it for you personally? Do you start to see things now differently? Because all we've had for 30 years, the historical record, <coughs> the books, and the newspapers have reflected the stories out. And they aren't right. It's as simple as that. Uh, so what I try to do is accurately and uh, detailed as possible is to start to look at the series from the stats perspective. But again, as, the more I dug, the more other facts I started to find. Things that weren't necessarily related to simple stats. It was things related to what happened in the games. Maybe why certain players did well, maybe why certain players didn't. I'd like, I'd like to show you this next clip. Nine seconds. Keep an eye on Ron Ellis, number six. If I wrote down this time. Sorry, I think I'm off the, the timing just a few seconds ago. Henderson skates over the blue line, gets stopped. Ron Ellis? Ron Ellis got crushed there. When you watch the replay, he's he probably lucky he didn't break his neck. He got tripped and fell into uh, the defenseman's leg. Nobody really realized this. It's not really being spoken about and certainly not talked about in terms of uh, what does that mean? Because we all know that Ron Ellis did not score in 72 Summit Series. When I did my revised stats, I found he had like 25 shots. Sorry, the, the rewind on here just uh, slowed down. But watch, watch Ron Ellis here. Very, very close to He was on the bench. Couldn't even move. By Toronto, it was worse. Couldn't even lift his arm over his head. Yet, Ron Ellis played all eight games. Because after game one, he was talking, I think, with uh, John Ferguson and saying, I'm not sure I can play. And they asked him, Can you still skate? And he said, Yes. And they said, Can you check Harlem off? And he said, Yes. And he said, That's all we want you to do. And if you're watching the games uh, through the series, what you end up seeing. Sorry, we'll go to this next part. The auto center will return in a second. What you end up seeing is you can actually see Ron Ellis on Canada's bench during some of the games, like trying to, trying to loosen up his neck, especially the games with Canada. And if you <coughs> Uh, Joe Schro comes over and starts massaging his neck before the camera pans. Why? Because he was so stiff and 
so sore that they were doing everything they could, literally, to keep them in the lineup. So now that we know that, we can look at Ron Ellis and say, instead of Ron Ellis being a disappointment for only you know, getting a few assists and no goals, having all those shots, now we can look at Ron Ellis and say, that's amazing. He probably shouldn't have been in the lineup at all. Maybe not even played again until, uh, until the uh, Soviet games of the series. Uh, the other part is um, he said he couldn't even shoot the puck properly. And it wasn't until my...